Well, we started looking at the nature of the church. What is it? Where did this come from? How did this get started? And asking these things from the perspective of a complete, you know, completely new and objective introduction to what this is, what it was designed to be, what it ought to be. And uh, we looked at the fact that the church is the congregation or the assembly of the people who worship God whenever they come together. And it always has been that. And we talked about the promises that God made to Abraham by faith and the inheritance of those promises today by faith in the same way. But when it gets down right down into the New Testament and the time of the establishment of Jesus as the Christ, the King, we start to ask these questions. Sometimes people wonder, is the church Jewish? Perhaps if it's Jewish in origin, or is it a, a Jewish religion or, or sect or subset? This is a valid question, and we ask that question as we look at the definitions. So I think that should be done as well so that we can understand something that needs to be said. First, of course, it's true that you know, in our modern speech in English, the word church is necessarily a word that refers to Christians, not to Jews. And the word Jewish in English is a word that refers to those who are not Christians specifically. They also, perhaps you would say, are um, of those Abrahamic religions, they sometimes would say. Uh, and it's true, in our current way of speaking, when you say the word church, you're talking about Christians. And when you say uh, the word synagogue, you're talking about Jews, for example. Um, but as we pointed out previously, and we mentioned now, that the Bible was not written in English. And these are translations, and we shouldn't limit our thinking about what God has said by modern perspectives and modern languages. It's important, I think, to establish that Yes, we understand there's a difference in the way that people think about these things today and the way that people draw lines today, and that's not in any way what we're considering at the moment. What is true, though, is that uh, the church as the gathering or the congregation of the people who worship God is not different from, you know, in your New Testament from whatever it is used to be in centuries prior. The, the meaning of the word is simply the gathering, the congregation, the assembly of the people who are worshiping God. Um, so that word that's being translated church in your New Testaments was also used in your Old Testaments, at least in the Greek translations of the Old Testaments. And it was being used in all the places where you read the congregation of the people of Israel. You know, tell, you know, all this congregation, the congregation in the wilderness, which is directly quoted in Acts 7 by, um, by Stephen. That word means and has always meant the congregation the assembly, the people who worship him. It was used back then by Moses, and it was used in the New Testament by everybody who spoke about these matters. And I say that to indicate that our modern perspective of this kind of clean break and clear delineation is not actually biblical. The biblical idea is that this was supposed to be one continuous thing of the people of God, and it was always intended to be the way that is recorded in Scripture. So I want us to look at that. Let the Bible define it, not modern perspectives. 
So first thing we ought to do is look at what the writers of the New Testament had to say about it. In this case, I'm, I'm just looking at Paul, but that's fine. He's representative. When we look at his letter to the church or the Christians that are in Rome, multiple churches, it appears, in the third chapter and in the ninth chapter, we'll look at a couple of things here. But the New Testament writers acknowledged ancient Israel. The New Testament writers taught that ancient Israel was completely legit. That was the real thing. That is the people of God. That was of God. It was intended by him, designed by him, commanded by him. We should say this first of all, you know, that it was not intended by them or anybody else for this to be something other than what God has always been doing. When you read Romans 3, as Paul reasons about this, he said, what advantage is there for the Jew? What is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So the perspective of the New Testament is, it's of every advantage to you to be an ancient Israelite. What advantage do they have in every way? There, there's every advantage. If you were an ancient Israelite, that was an advantage in every way. Chiefly, as he said, because the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. This is a thing that needs to be understood well. The oracles of God means the, the revealed utterances of God. This is what we call inspiration of the scriptures. They're the ones who wrote the Bible in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. This was all put together by ancient Israelites. And somebody will say, well, Mark and Luke are not Hebrew names. That's true. Neither is Stephen <laughs> in Acts 7. But Mark is clearly the scribe for Peter, and Luke is the scribe for Paul. Paul quotes Luke's gospel in his letters to Timothy. Um, Israelites are responsible for the entire text. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. It's every advantage to be a part of that nation or to have been a part of that nation. And I'll remind you that Jesus and all of his apostles were ancient Israelites. As we say, Paul was, those that wrote these things were. That is true. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. They knew what scripture was and what scripture was not. This is why, to me, you know, any discussion of these other books of the Old Testament the, that are called deuterocanonical in friendly circles, apocryphal in more... more critical circles, the Apocrypha. Uh, they clearly are excluded from Scripture because to the Jews were given the oracles of God and they did not recognize these books. And it was entirely up to them. They did not recognize them. That settles it. There's no discussion to be had about whether those books are part of the Old Testament. They're not. How do you know? Because the Jews were entrusted with the oracles and they did not recognize those books. So also in the fourth and fifth verses of the ninth chapter, Paul reasons again about the nation, saying the, to the Israelites pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Ancient Israel, for Paul, you know, as he writes, is legit. They legitimately own these things. They were adopted as God's sons, if you will, through the selection you know, from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob. The glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, that's the law of Moses. The ordering of the worship of God, the promises that had been made, they received these things. This is legitimately theirs. And the fifth verse, from their race, or of whom are the fathers, from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But Jesus is an Israelite. The anointed one, the Christ, came according to the flesh 
from ancient Israel. That is true. They were all of them ancient Israelites. They legitimately owned that. But as he said in the fourth verse, that the law, you know, the covenants, the worship belong to them. The oracles of God back in chapter 3 belong to them. Shouldn't we listen to what they said? Is it enough to say, oh yeah, that was theirs, that was real? Well, it's true it was theirs and it was real, but shouldn't we also therefore listen to what they said? How real is it if you're not listening to what they're saying? That's the question. The Law and the Prophets had something to say about this. In fact, what is true is that the Law and the Prophets, the Law of Moses and the Prophets of Israel, they all spoke of something or someone else who was coming in the future. Now, this is just fact. When you look through the Scriptures, you can see it. Moses himself said, God will raise another prophet like me from among you. Moses said this. But all of them are like it. I would turn you to Jeremiah chapter 31 for a bit. The prophet, of course, recognized, known, accepted, established, authoritative, however you want to describe that. Jeremiah, he's the real deal. A prophet in Judah. A lot of things that he has to say, but notice this one in particular, 31 and 32 of the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Just these two verses, and I realize the context continues down through the 30, 34th verse at least, but just these two, Jeremiah 31 and 32, look at what he says. The days are coming. I will make a new covenant with Israel this covenant will not be like or follow after the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. There's coming a new covenant that God will establish, and it's not going to be following the pattern of the one that was established following Egypt. What was established following Egypt? When he took them by the hand and led them out, that is Mount Sinai. That's the law of Moses. Jeremiah says very explicitly, the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, when God took the people of Israel, the congregation of Israel, the church, out of Egypt, and delivered to them the new covenant at Mount Sinai, that one is not forever. It's going to be replaced. There will be a new covenant, says the prophet Jeremiah, inspired by God. An ancient Israelite, yes, but an ancient Israelite who realizes, because God has revealed it to him, that something else is coming. Something else is coming. Jeremiah prophesied an end to the law of Moses and the establishment of a new covenant. The other word for covenant, testament. The New Testament, the new covenant. That's why it's called the New Testament. It's the new covenant. It's the covenant that Jesus talked about. This is the covenant in my blood. Right? These are the ideas that follow with it. 
There's coming a day when he will make a new covenant, not like the one that was made with Moses at Sinai. It's very explicit. That thing's coming to an end. Something else will be established. You turn with me into the Psalms. Let's leave Jeremiah. Over to Psalm number 110. A Psalm of David. It's not very long. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will execute kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill the places with dead bodies and execute the heads of many countries. He'll drink the blood, uh, or he'll drink of the, the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he'll lift up his head. This is a psalm about a king who is reigning with the power that God grants to him to reign. It is a psalm of David. And it says right there at the beginning, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now here's the thing. You know, David is well before Jeremiah. This is the second king of ancient Israel. David is the father of the kings of Judah. He's the first in the, in the line of kings that you know comes from him. He is the father, the progenitor. All of the kings of Judah are sons of David from that point forward. And this psalm that David wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is clearly about God's king. We just looked at it. It's very obvious what he's saying. This king is the rod, has a rod of strength that comes out of Zion. He rules in the midst of his enemies. God is at his right hand to execute wrath against foreign kings. This is a king. However, the Lord God says to my Lord, said David, you sit at my right hand. If David is the father of every king of Judah who comes afterward, how can he say this descendant of his is his Lord? David cannot call his own descendants his Lord under normal circumstances. Those who are descended from you are not your Lord. It's the other way around as a rule, but this is different. Here is a king reigning in Zion, verse 2, which is Jerusalem, which is the place David reigns, which is the kingdom forevermore from David's point of view in Judah. And this descendant, he calls Lord. How can David call him his Lord? How does he outrank David? There's something very unique about this king. That's what we're saying. There's something very unique about the king in this psalm. He outranks David somehow. And also in the fourth verse, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Another thing that he said to this one, who is David's Lord, and yet the king of Zion. David, father of the kings of Judah, as we mentioned before, lived under the law of Moses. He was Jewish. He was an ancient Israelite. It is true. And the law of Moses was rather clear. Anybody read Numbers 14, Numbers 16 lately? That priests come from one father, from Levi, the tribe of Levi. Father Aaron, actually, specifically, the tribe of Levi, though. The law, under the law of Moses, the priests come from the tribe of Levi. David, however, is from the tribe of Judah. 
And his sons are clearly from the tribe of Judah because they're reckoned after their father. And the tribes of Judah, or uh, sorry, the children of David, the sons of David, continue to reign in Judah for the rest of its duration as a nation. So David was therefore prophesying a king who was very different in more than one way. We said already that son was going to be different from all the other descendants because he would be the Lord of David. But now, look at this. This son is also going to be, first of all, not just the king, but also a priest. You are a priest forever. To the king, he says this. That's not possible under Moses. Because the sons of David are from Judah, and the priests are from Levi. It can't be the law of Moses. It can't be what Moses did at Sinai and ratified, and what God confirmed and ratified. That covenant, that agreement, that arrangement, that's not, that can't be the final. Something else is coming. Someone else is coming who is greater, a descendant of David, who's greater than David, a descendant of David who is both king and priest. And he's not just a priest, but it says the order is Melchizedek. It's not going to follow the order of priests that are assigned by Moses, which is Levitical. Melchizedek, who is this? This was a man who was priest of the Most High God in the days of Abraham. Not Moses, 400 plus years before Moses. He was priest in the days of Abraham. Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to this priest named Melchizedek. The psalm is telling us there's coming in a covenant, and it's not a covenant like the one that's at Sinai. He's saying exactly what Jeremiah 31 was saying. They agree with each other. Something else is coming, a different agreement that has different parameters and a different priesthood. And yes, we have Isaiah 53. In the third and final example that we'll use today, although there are many, Isaiah said, somebody is coming. Fifth and sixth verses said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's somebody who is going to reconcile. There's an individual who will bear the punishment for all of us. The chastisement, the punishment is played on him, but the peace is given to us. The wounds, the stripes are his, but the healing is ours. Isaiah sees this. Somebody is coming who will give of himself. The individual in question is Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the one who came, who brought us peace by accepting the punishment for sin. But you see, Isaiah understood somebody was coming who would take this role, who would suffer for the people, who would give himself, who would suffer because it was the will of God that he should suffer. There's a whole lot of things in Isaiah 53 
but we can leave it right there. A reconciler is coming. Somebody is going to reconcile the people back to God by giving himself. Somebody is going to take the brunt of the punishment on behalf of the people. Now let's do the other thing here in Matthew 5. But again, as you're turning to Matthew 5, we note the prophets agree. Something else is coming. Something different is coming. The law of Moses was never intended to be the end. Those who were under the law of Moses saw the end of that law coming. A different monarchy, a different priesthood, a different covenant, a different mediator. They saw it. But now in Matthew 5, we should say this, Jesus did not come to abolish the law of Moses. He was very plain about that in his own teaching in the 17th and 18th verses of Matthew 5. Do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. Assuredly, I tell you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law of Moses until it is all fulfilled. He came to fulfill it, meaning everything that is in it has to come true. Everything that is in it has to be satisfied and met. And that's what he came to do. And if you look at what he goes on to teach immediately following this, for example, in the 21st and 22nd verses, what you'll find is that Jesus is not abolishing the law. He's strengthening the law. He's strengthening Moses. He takes what Moses says and he binds what Moses means. The people were getting accustomed to, you know, being technically correct. You know? It was said, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. You know what they were teaching? They were teaching that it was all right as long as he didn't die. That's what they were teaching, which is clearly not what Moses intended. And Jesus said, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause will be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of counsel. And whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Jesus does not make murder acceptable. Jesus does not break the law of Moses regarding murder. No, he completely fulfills what Moses said. Not only does he forbid the murder, of course, but he's forbidding all of the sins that lead to murder. The unjust anger, the insults, the railing accusations, the fury, all of that is content, condemned in the teaching of Jesus. If you get rid of those things, you don't have murder. That's the deal. All murder is a hate crime, you know. <laughs> if you can stop people from hating their brothers, you can stop murder. He does the same in the 27th verse. You've heard it was said to those of old, you should not commit adultery. And that's what people do. They say, well, as long as you don't. And then they argue over the definition of adultery. As long as it stops short of this, it's okay. Don't hurt to look what the old ones say. But actually what Jesus said was, I tell you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye makes you sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Well, is Jesus serious about that? I think so. I think so. Jesus does not make adultery acceptable. Jesus does not break the law of Moses. No. He is absolutely, completely fulfilling it in the same way that we saw with murder. He forbids adultery, but he also forbids the things that lead up to adultery. If you're not looking with lust in the heart, 
if you're not already thinking of these things, if you are able to turn your eyes, then adultery doesn't happen. And stopping short of that, as he said, if you're looking with the intent to lust, that's already a sin. Just as we said before, the unjust anger, the railing accusations, these things are already sins, short of murder. And yes, at the 31st verse, again, you've heard it said to those of old, you'll not swear falsely. Wait a minute. That's 33rd verse. Sorry. 31. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, they said. But I tell you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except, except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who's divorced commits adultery. Jesus is not making divorce acceptable. He's completely fulfilling what the law intended. When he said, let them give her a certificate of divorce, it meant she needed some kind of protection under the law. Jesus is saying, look, if you are divorcing her, then when she goes and commits adultery because you put her out, that's your fault. That's better than a certificate of divorce. It's your fault. When you deny your spouse their due love, you're at fault when the divorce results from that. That's what Jesus is saying. Divorces are always the result of a hard heart. Somebody's heart is hard. They're not giving the due love. And maybe it's you. Maybe it's not the person who goes and commits adultery. Maybe they go and commit adultery because you have been acting in this way that Jesus condemns. So he's not breaking the law about divorce or the protection for the wife. In fact, he's strengthening it. And it's the same with the oath as we read in 33. Yes, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your oaths to the Lord. That's what it was saying. But he says to us in the 37th verse, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Whatever is more than these is from the evil one. The law, you know, Jesus is not making it acceptable to, to give false testimony, to swear falsely. He's not breaking the law of Moses. He's saying, you don't need to swear. You're not going to swear falsely because you're not going to swear. You don't need to swear. You just tell the simple truth. If you say yes, it's yes. If you say no, it's no. You don't need to swear. You're truthful with or without an oath in the presence of a court or otherwise. That strengthens it. When we say he does not come to abolish the law, he doesn't. He comes to fulfill every righteous requirement of the law. Everything that it's saying there is not meant to be a point of order, a cultural moray. These are about the heart, and Jesus' teaching is about the heart, and it absolutely fulfills the law. There's nothing in the law of Moses that is contrary to Jesus' teaching. There's nothing in the teaching of the Lord that breaks the law. Jesus kept it perfectly. So when he says he came not to break these things or abolish these things, but to fulfill these things, what we mean is that he came and he did absolutely everything that is required by that law. Every aspect of it was fulfilled by his own life and is fulfilled in his teaching. There is a prophecy that is recorded or referenced, rather, in Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 10, and we won't read all of it at the moment. But in this prophecy, he says in the seventh verse of Hebrews 10, Behold, I've come in the volume of the book it is written about me to do your will, O God. This is Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, if you're interested in it. But it's saying that Jesus came to do his will. He wasn't taking, uh, he wasn't happy, verse 6, with burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. What he wanted was perfection. And Jesus said, I've come in the volume of that book, the complete law of Moses 
to fulfill it, to do it. We're not offering sacrifices for the sins of Jesus because Jesus doesn't have any sins. He completely fulfilled the entirety of that law. And in Romans 8, also, Paul puts it this way. When he says there in Romans 8, it's verses 3 and 4. that the righteous requirement of the law of Moses is fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What he's saying here, Christ you know, the life of Christ, when, you, when we live this way, when we follow the teaching of what Jesus said, we fulfill every requirement of the law. Everything that's in here has a purpose and a reason why it's said this way, and Jesus fulfills all of those things in his teaching if you live that way. Yes, he said it this way subsequently in Romans 10. It's verses 2 through 4. Christ is the end of the law of Moses for righteousness to everyone who believes. The intent of that law, the purpose of the law of Moses, was for all to submit to God's justice in his chosen king, his anointed. He always intended to bring justice and he always intended to bring justice by means of belief in him, as was indicated to Abraham. And the teaching of Jesus absolutely fulfills those things without any conflict, without any problem. And I ask you to look with me as well in Acts 2. Isn't it the case that the one whom God chose was made clear by God himself? when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember that Jeremiah in the 31st verse said there was a new covenant coming that would replace the law of Moses. Remember that David saw a new monarchy and a new priesthood coming. Remember that Isaiah saw a new mediator who would sacrifice of himself on behalf of the people. See, in Acts 2, what the apostles said in their testimony was that David spoke about him in Acts 2, 25. David says concerning him in Psalm 16, I foresaw the Lord always before my face and on down. But it's at the 27th verse, you'll not leave my soul in Hades, you'll not allow your Holy One to see corruption, meaning to undergo decay, which is why in the 26th verse he said, my flesh will rest in hope, because his flesh will not see decay. And at the 29th verse, David is dead and buried, his tomb is with us. Since he was a prophet, verse 30, and since he knew God, swore with an oath that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he'd raise up the anointed to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing it, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. That he, the Christ, was not left in Hades. That he, his flesh, did not see decay. And this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. David said somebody would not undergo decay, that somebody would not be left in the underworld of the dead. And then Jesus is resurrected from the dead as witnessed by all of his apostles and some 500 people, according to 1 Corinthians 15. What's the conclusion? Well, there's only one conclusion. It's verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know with certainty. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's the only one that fulfills all of these things. 
That's why he said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The apostles are the witnesses of this. He sent them to observe, or to teach us rather, to observe all that he has commanded in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus now is the lawgiver. Jesus now has established a new covenant. This resurrection from the dead is the proof that he is the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, the Christ. He is the king that David was writing about, who is priest and king. He is the servant that Isaiah was writing about, who gave of himself and became the mediator on behalf of the people. He is the one to establish the new covenant that Jeremiah wrote about. And what is that? Well, as Paul says it in Acts 26, in closing, it's the hope of the 12 tribes of Israel. He said, my manner of youth, Acts 26, 4 through 8, spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know they knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. It is for this Hope's sake that I am currently being accused by the leaders of Judea. That's true. Paul stood trial before Rome, accused by the leaders of Judea. Why? Because he is the strictest of Jews and believes in the promise made by God to the fathers, the promise in which the twelve tribes hope to attain. And what is that? Why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? That's the hope of Israel. And Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. That's why he is the priest. That's why he is the king. That's why he has a name above every name. This is the hope of Israel. This is the point of the law of Moses. It always was. God does raise the dead. Jesus is raised forevermore. And you too can be raised in newness of life today if you become a Christian, if you become a child of God, if you obey the King of Israel, the Israel of God, Jesus the Christ. You can be resurrected a new person when you repent of your sins, when you're confessing him as the, the anointed, the Son of God, when you are baptized in his name, you are forgiven. His blood washes away every sin, and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are a new person. And yes, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are a part of the Israel of God, a Christian. And you have not just the hope in this life because God answers your prayers and Jesus mediates on your behalf, but also the hope in life eternal that when you die, if Jesus doesn't come back first, there's something after this. There's something better than this. There's a reason to live today, to live for God today, to make the right choices today. But it starts with your repentance. It starts with your obedience. We have water prepared for you to be baptized. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Let us pray for you to be restored to him. But yes, this is nothing but what God has been saying for millennia, well before the time of Christ in the first century AD, that he would save us, that he would justify us, that he would bring about a work that nobody could have foreseen. If today you are not a Christian, Obey God. Partake in the great blessings that he extends to us. If today you are a Christian and haven't lived right, repent. Let us pray for you. 
If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known by coming to the front while you stand, while we stand, while we sing.